Chapter 31 Madhurya Ras Krishna Swarup, the Nayak, and the Swakya Nayikas. It was a very pleasant time in the autumn season. One night, at about ten o'clock, the earth had put on a sari of cool, gentle moonlight, and her beauty had become intensely attractive. Vijay Kumar was reading Ujjwala Nilamani and pondering deeply on the subject matter when his gaze suddenly fell upon the auspicious radiance of the moonlight. His heart became filled with an indescribable rapture, and he thought, This is a very beautiful time. Why not go immediately and have darshan of Sundarachala? I have heard that whenever Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had darshan of Sundarachala, he saw a spurti of Brajadam. Thinking like this, he set off alone in the direction of Sundarachala. By this time, Vijay Kumar was taking instructions in the practice of bhajan in pure Madhurya Ras. His thoughts only flowed towards hearing about Krishna's Braja Leela and specifically Sri Krishna's pastimes with the gopis. Any other topics had become tasteless to him. He passed Balagandi and made his way towards Shraddhavali. As he saw the small forests on either side, a spurti of Vrindavan manifested before his eyes. He became overwhelmed with Prem and said, A whole, I am so fortunate. I am having darshan of that Braja Bhumi, which is extremely difficult to attain, even for the Devatas, such as Brahma. How beautiful these forest bowers are! Look at this Kunjavana! Oh, what am I seeing! Within this mandap of Madhavi Malati creepers, the master of my life, Sri Krishna is sitting with the gopis and laughing and joking with them. Vijay Kumar became very restless. Abandoning fear and consideration of formalities, he ran at full speed in that direction, not even aware of his body and mind. However, after going just a short distance, he fainted and fell to the ground unconscious. A gentle breeze began to serve him, and after a short time he regained his external senses. He looked in all directions, but the vision was nowhere to be seen. After some time he returned to his dwelling, grief-stricken, and lay down on his bed without saying anything to anyone. Vijay Kumar was exceedingly delighted by the spurti of Brajalila. In his heart he thought, Tomorrow, at the lotus feet of Sri Gurudev, I will submit a description of the confidential mystery that I have seen tonight. However, the next moment he recalled that one should not tell others if, by great fortune, one happened to see the confidential Aprakat Leela. Reflecting like this, he gradually fell asleep. The next day, after honouring Prasad, he went to the house of Kasi Mishra, offered his sastang pranam to his Gurudev and sat before him. Sri Gurudev embraced him affectionately and inquired about his well-being. Vijay Kumar was very happy to see his Gurudev. Composing himself, he said, Prabhu, by your unlimited grace, my human life has become successful. Now I long to know some confidential tattvas in regard to Sri Ujjwala Ras. I have been reading Ujjwala Nilamani, and there are certain parts whose purport I cannot comprehend. May I ask you some questions about it? Goswami Vijay, you are my beloved disciple. You are quite welcome to ask whatever questions you wish to, and I will try to answer them as far as I can. Vijay Prabhu of the Mukya Rasas, Madhurya Ras has been called the Rasa that gives rise to an abundance of mysteries. And why not, since the qualities of the other four Rasas, Shanta, Dasya, Sakya and Vatsalya, are eternally present in Madhurya Ras. Whatever astonishing and wonderful qualities they lack 
are perfectly and beautifully established in Madhurya Ras. Consequently, Madhurya Ras is without any doubt superior to all others. Madhurya Ras is quite inappropriate for those who take shelter of the path of impersonal renunciation, because their hearts are dry. At the same time, those who are attracted to mundane sense gratification also find Madhurya Ras difficult to understand, because it is exactly the opposite of mundane nature. The Madhurya Ras of Braj is not easy to attain, because it is completely different from Shringara Ras within this material world. So why does the Aprakat Madhurya Ras appear just like the despicable mundane Ras between men and women in material existence? Goswami Vijay, you know well that all the varieties in the mundane sphere are a reflection of the varieties in the transcendental sphere, and the material world itself is also the reflection of the spiritual world. There is a profound secret in this, namely that the nature of the reflected experience is naturally reversed. Whatever is most exalted in the original existence or form becomes most abominable in the reflection, and whatever is lowest in the original form is seen as highest in its reflected existence. Every part and limb of the body appears in a reversed form in its reflection in a mirror. Similarly, the Paramavastu, supreme transcendental reality, is reflected by the influence of his own inconceivable Shakti. The shadow of that Shakti has expanded itself in full detail in the form of mundane existence. Consequently, all the characteristics of the Paramavastu appear in their reversed form in material existence. Transcendental Rasa, which is the very nature of Paramavastu, is reflected in this insentient material world as the abominable mundane Ras. The astonishing, matchless, variegated happiness in the Paramavastu is its own innate Ras. But when it is reflected in the inert plane, the conditioned jiva imagines that this principle has material designations and attributes. He then decides that the spiritual substance is only formless and featureless, nirvishesh, and imagines that, since variety is absent in the nirvishesh tattva, all kinds of variety must be essentially mundane. Consequently, he cannot comprehend the eternal nature of transcendental existence, which is free from all material attributes, because it is totally beyond them. This is the inevitable result of using logic to try to understand the truth. Actually, the Parama Vastu is full of astonishing varieties because it is the embodiment of all rasa. Since spiritual varieties are reflected in mundane ras, one can take help from the varieties of mundane ras to infer the existence and qualities of the spiritual ras beyond one sense perception. The varieties of rasa in the Paramavastu are as follows. In the spiritual world, the Shanta Dharma that embodies Shanta Ras is in the lowest position. Above this is Dasya Ras, and above that Sakya Ras. Above Sakya Ras is Vatsalya Ras, and Madhurya Ras reigns splendidly above all. In the material world, everything is in the reversed order, so Madhurya Ras is on the lowest level. Vatsalya Ras is above it. Sakya is above Vatsalya, and Shantaras is the highest of all. The position and activities of the reflection of Madhurya Ras in the mundane world are extremely petty and shameful. Consequently, people who deliberate on Rasa Tattva from the mundane perspective conclude that Madhurya Ras is wretched and contemptible. Actually, 
In the spiritual world, it is completely pure, immaculate, and full of astonishing sweetness. There the meeting of Krishna and his various types of Shakti, as Purush Prakriti, is completely pure, and the origin of all truth. In the material world, the mundane behavior between men and women is indeed shameful. However, there is no transgression of Dharma in the spiritual world, because Krishna is the only Purush, and all the Chittattvas in this rasa are Prakriti. In the material world, one jiva becomes the enjoyer, and another jiva becomes the enjoyed, and they want to relate with each other in that way. This affair becomes abhorrent and shameful because it is completely opposed to fundamental tattva. In tattva, one jiva is not the enjoyer of another jiva. On the contrary, Sri Krishna is the only enjoyer, and all jivas are to be enjoyed by him. The situation in which the jiva becomes the enjoyer is against his eternal dharma. Actually, there is no doubt that this state of affairs is utterly shameful and despicable. From the perspective of reality and its reflection, it is inevitable that the behavior of mundane men and women will appear to be identical to Krishna's immaculate pastimes. Even though one is thoroughly base, and the other is supremely valuable and meaningful. Vijay Prabhu, now that I have heard this unprecedented siddhanta and conception, my purpose has been accomplished. My self-evident conviction has now become firm, and all my doubts are dispelled. I have now understood the position of Madhurya Ras within the spiritual world. Aho! Just as the very word Madhurya Ras means sweet, its transcendental bhav also gives rise to such supreme bliss, Paramananda. Who is so unfortunate as one who finds satisfaction in Shantaras, when there is a rasa such as Madhurya Ras? Prabhu, I wish to hear the elaborate and full explanation of the philosophy and principles of the confidential Madhurya Ras. Goswami Listen, Baba. Krishna is the Vishaya of Madhurya Ras. His dearly beloved gopis are the Ashraya, and both together are the Alamban of this Ras. Vijay What is the beautiful form of Krishna as the Vishaya of this Ras? Goswami Aho! What a sweet question! Krishna's complexion is the hue of a monsoon cloud. He is charming and sweet, and he has all auspicious bodily characteristics. He is a strong, budding youth, and an eloquent and endearing speaker. He is intelligent, splendid, sober, skillful, clever, happy, grateful, sincere, and he is controlled by love. He is profound, super-excellent and famous. He steals the hearts of young damsels, and he is ever fresh. He enjoys incomparable pastimes. He is exquisitely beautiful, and he is the most dearly beloved who plays upon his vamsi. Krishna is the only person who has these qualities. The beauty of his two lotus feet has crushed to dust Kandarpa's pride. His sidelong glance enchants the hearts of all, and he is a treasury of playful pastimes. Vijay I have fully realized that Sri Krishna, with his apricot form and qualities, is the only Nayak of the supremely wonderful transcendental Madhurya Ras. Previously I studied various Shastras, and I used logic and reasoning to meditate on the form of Krishna. But my faith in his form did not become firmly established. However, through your mercy, bhakti based on ruchi has arisen within my heart. Since my heart has been purified by devotion, I am continuously experiencing the spurti of Krishna there, day and night. Even though I leave Krishna, Krishna does not leave my heart. Aho! 
How merciful he is! Now I really understand. Sarvataiva duroho yam abhaktan bhagavatrasa tatpadam buja sarvaishva bhakti evan urasyate vyatiya bhavana vartma yaschamatkara barabu hridi sattvo jalabadam svadate sarasomata Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, Southern Division, 5, 78-79 Translation Only the Shuddha Bhaktas who accept Sri Krishna's lotus feet as their all in all can experience this Bhagavat Ras. One can never experience this Rasa or realize it if his heart does not have the slightest scent of Bhakti, if he is full of mundane sentiments, and if his sunscars have moulded his nature so that he is addicted to logic. End of translation. Prabhu, I have realised that Ras is the supremely pure and wondrous bhav that arises in the heart when it is illuminated by Shuddha Sattva, and that it transcends the limit of a human being's power of contemplation. Rasa is the entity of the spiritual world, and it is absent in the mundane world. It manifests upon the pure existence, sutta, of the jiva, who is by nature an atomic particle of consciousness, chitkana. This rasa is experienced in the state of bhakti samadhi, one who has Sri Gurudev's mercy and can discriminate between shuddha sattva, pure goodness, and mishra sattva, mixed goodness, will have no doubt about this at all. Goswami, what you have said is absolutely true. Now I will ask you a question to dispel many of your doubts. Simply by answering it, you will realize a transcendental tattva. Tell me, what is the difference between Shuddha Sattva and Mishra Sattva? Vijay Kumar offers Sastang Dandavat Pranam to Sri Gurudev's feet and said humbly, Prabhu, by your mercy, I will explain it to the best of my ability. Please correct me if I make any mistake. That which has existence is called sutta, and a substance that has an actual position, form, quality, and activity can be called sattva. Shuddha sattva is sattva that has no beginning or end and whose form is eternally new. It is not contaminated by the divisions of past and future time, and it always remains thoroughly astonishing. Shuddha Sattva includes all aspects of existence that are the products of the pure spiritual energy, Shuddha Chit Shakti. In Maya, which is the shadow of the Chit Shakti, there is transformation of time as past and future. All aspects of existence in this Maya contain the Raja Dham, function of the mode of passion, and Maya, for they have a beginning. They also contain the Tamo Dharm, function of the mode of ignorance, for they have an end. Mishra Sattva refers to aspects of Mayik Sattva that have a beginning and an end. Now, the pure Jiva is Shuddha Sattva, and his form, qualities and activities are also composed of Shuddha Sattva. However, since the Shuddha Jeev was conditioned, the two qualities of Maya, Rajagun and Tamagun, have become mixed with his pure Sattva. Therefore, the conditioned Jiva is called Mishra Sattva, mixed existence or mixed goodness. Goswami Baba you have presented an extremely subtle Siddhanta. Now tell me, how is the heart of the Jiva illuminated by Shuddha Sattva? Vijay The Shuddha Sattva, pure existence of the Jiva, does not manifest clearly as long as he remains conditioned in the material world. He realizes his Swarup to the extent that this Shuddha Sattva arises but he cannot attain this result by any sudden 
of Kam or Gyan. The reason is as follows. No bodily impurity can be eradicated by another substance that is itself impure. Mundane karma is impure by nature, so how can it remove the contamination of mayic impurity on the jiva? As for gyan, it is like fire, for it burns the impurity, and at the same time it obliterates the fundamental sattva, existence, along with it. How can this give rise to the happiness that comes from having cleansed the impurity? Thus, Shuddha Sattva can only appear through Bhakti, which arises by the mercy of Krishna and the Vaishnavas. When Bhakti appears, Shuddha Sattva illuminates the heart. Goswami, it is a pleasure to give instructions to a person as qualified as you. Now, what else do you wish to inquire about? Vijay, you have already explained that there are four types of Nayak, Dhirodhata, Dhira Lalita, Dhira Shanta, and Dhirodhata. Which one of these is Krishna? Goswami, all of these four types of heroic characteristics are present in Krishna. The mutually contradictory bhavs that are seen in these four types of Nayak are all present in Nayak Krishna through his Achintya Shakti, and he has the Shakti to maintain all the rasas at once. These bhavs act according to Krishna's desire. Krishna, who is endowed with the characteristics of all four types of Nayak, also has another fascinating and secret peculiarity, which only extraordinarily qualified people are eligible to know. Vijay, since you have already bestowed your great mercy upon me, kindly tell me this tattva also. Vijay Kumar's eyes filled with tears as he said this, and he fell at Goswami's feet. Goswamiji lifted him up and embraced him, his own eyes also filled with tears, as he said in a voice choked with emotion, Baba, the confidential mystery is that in Madhurya Ras, Krishna is two distinct types of Nayak. He is husband, Pati, and Paramo, Upapati, as well. Vijay, Prabhu, Krishna is our eternal Pati. He should only be called Pati. So why is there a relationship of Upapati? Goswami, this is a profound mystery. Spiritual affairs are like mysterious jewels, but among them, Parakya Madhurya Ras is like the Kastuba Mani. Vijay, Bhaktas who have taken shelter of Madhurya Ras engage in bhajan with the bhav that Krishna is their pati. What is the deep import of considering Krishna as one's upapati? Goswami, no rasa whatsoever appears if one conceives of paratattva as impersonal and worships it in an impersonal mood, nirvishesh bhav. This process denies the validity of Vedic statements such as raso vaisa. That supreme, absolute truth is the personification of all rasa. Chandogya Upanishad 8.13.1 Nirvishesh Bhav is useless because of its severe lack of happiness. However, from another angle of vision, the experience of rasa can be developed progressively in accordance with the variety of Savishesh Bhav. You should understand that rasa is the primary tattva of the paratattva. The Savishesh Bhav, called Ishwara Bhav, in which one relates to the Supreme as controller, is somewhat superior to Nirvishesh Bhav, and the Prabhu Bhav of Dasya Ras is higher than the Ishwara Bhav of Shantaras. Sakya Ras is more elevated than Dasya Ras, but Salya Ras is still more superior and Madhurya Ras is the topmost of all. Just as there is a sequence among these bhavs, each being better than the previous one, similarly, Parakya Madhurya Ras is superior to Swakya. There are two tattvas, Atmas, one's own, and Para, 
others as ashraya. The natural tendency to be fixed in the self, atmanishta dharm, is called atmaramata, the satisfaction of being situated in the self. And in this atmaramata, rasa has no assistance from any separate entity. Krishna has this quality of being eternally self-satisfied. However, at the same time, the quality of enjoying with the assistance of others, paramata dham, also exists in him eternally. The aggregate of contradictory characteristics is present together simultaneously in Parama Purush Sri Krishna. This is the intrinsic and constitutional nature of the Supreme Absolute Truth, Paratattva. In one aspect of Krishna Lila there is Atmaramata, while in its counterpart the quintessence of Paramata reigns splendidly to its fullest extent. The summit of this Pararamata is Parakya Bhav. Parakya Ras is the astonishing Ras that appears when the Nayak and Nayika are united by Rag attraction, even though the relationship between them is Parabhav. Bhav is accepting Para, another's consort. From Atmaramata to Parakya Madhurya Ras is the full spectrum of Ras. As rasa is drawn in the direction of atmaramata, it gradually becomes dry. Whereas to the extent that it is drawn towards parakya, it attains its fully blossomed state. When Krishna is the nayak, parakya ras can never be disgraceful. Whereas if any ordinary jiva becomes the nayak, the consideration of dharma and adharma arises, and parakya bhav then becomes extremely base. Thus poets have determined that the meeting between a male paramour and a married woman is utterly contemptible. However, Sri Rupa Goswami has said that although Alanka Shastra has described the Upapati as detestable and contemptible, this only applies to a mundane Prakrita Nayaka. No such conclusion can apply to Sri Krishna who is directly the transcendental source of all avatars. Vijay, kindly tell me about the distinct characteristic of Pati. Goswami, a Pati is one who has accepted the hand of a bride in marriage. Vijay, please explain the characteristics of Upapati and Parakya. Goswami, the Upapati is a man who is driven by intense attachment to transgress dharm and accept a parakya as his most dearly beloved. A parakya is a woman who neglects the dharma of this world and the next, transgresses the regulations of marriage and completely offers herself to a man other than her husband. There are two types of parakya, namely unmarried, kanya, and married, proda. Vijay, what are the symptoms of Swakya? Goswami, a chaste woman who has been married according to the regulative principles and who is always absorbed in following the orders of her husband is called Swakya. Vijay, who are Swakya and who are Parakya for Sri Krishna? Goswami, the married ladies of Dwakapuri are Swakya and the young gopis of Braj are mainly parakya. Vijay. Where are these two types of consorts situated in the Aprakat Leela? Goswami. This is a very confidential matter. You know that the domain of the Paratattva comprises four quarters. Three quarters of his opulence, Vibhuti, are manifest in the spiritual realm, and one quarter is in the material realm. Thus, the entire realm of Maya, consisting of fourteen planetary systems, is situated in one quarter of his bibhuti. The river Viraja lies between the material and spiritual worlds, the world of Maya being situated on this side of it, and the spiritual world on the other side of it. Brahmdham, which is composed of effulgence, surrounds the spiritual world, 
chit-jugget on all sides. Apart from that, when one penetrates beyond the Viraja, the spiritual sky, Paravyoma, is seen as some Vyoma Rup Vaikunta. There, Aishwarya is prominent, and Narayan reigns as the Lord of Lords, attended by unlimited, transcendental, majestic Shaktis. In Vaikunta, Bhagavan has Swakya Ras, and the Sri Bunila Shaktis serve him as Swakya consorts. Above Vaikunta lies Golok. In Vaikunta, the Swakya consorts of the city, Pura, remain absorbed in their appropriate services. In Golok, the young ladies of Braj serve Krishna in their particular rasa. Vijay, if Golok is Krishna's highest dham, then why have the wonderful glories of Braj been extolled? Goswami, places such as Braj, Gokul and Vrindavan are within Sri Mathura Mandal. Mathura Mandal and Golok are non-different from each other, a Beda Tattva. When this one phenomenon is situated in the highest region of the Chit Jagat, it is known as Golok. And when it is manifested within this material universe, it is called Mathura Mandal. Thus, it is celebrated simultaneously in these two Swarups. Vijay, how is that possible? I don't understand. Goswami, such phenomena are possible only by Krishna's Achintya Shakti. All the activities within the jurisdiction of Achintya Shakti are beyond comprehension and argument. That eternal abode of Golok is called Mathura Dham in the Parakya Lila within the world of gross elements, Prapancha, and this very same place is called Golok in Aprakat Lila. Krishna's transcendental pastimes are eternal, and Golok is eternally manifest in the Nitya Jagat. Those who have become eligible to have darshan of the pure spiritual substance see Golok. Not only that, but they can have darshan of Golok in Gokul itself. However, the jivas whose intelligence is material cannot attain the darshan of Golok. Even though Gokul is Golok, jivas with mundane intelligence see Gokul as an ordinary place in this material world, consisting of five gross elements. Vijay, what is the qualification to have darshan of Golok? Goswami, Sri Sugadev Goswami has said, Iti sanchintya bhagavan mahakarunaiko vibhu darshyam amsasvam lokam gopanam tamasaparam Satyam Gyanam Antam Yad Brahma Jyoti Sanatanam Yaddi Pashyanti Muneyo Guna Paye Samahita Srimad Bhagavatam 10, 28, 14-15 Translation Although the Gopas are eternally perfect, they nonetheless descend to this world as assistants in Krishna's pastimes. The Sadhana Siddha Gopas were the followers of those Nitya Siddha Gopas. These Sadhana Siddha Gopas thought, due to ignorance, the Jivas in this world identify themselves with their material bodies. Thus they are hankering with many types of desires, and they engage in various types of work in order to fulfill them. As a result, they wander aimlessly, accepting repeated birth in higher and lower species. We are also engaged in the same activity. Considering this, the greatly compassionate Bhagavan Sri Krishna, who has inconceivable majestic opulence, granted to those gopas darshan of his paramadam, Golok, which is beyond the dense darkness of Maya. The variety in that dham is eternal, absolute reality, full of unlimited spiritual pastimes. That dham is eternally self-illuminated with the effulgence of Brahm, and it is perceived by the hosts of sages and sadhaks through trance in the stage beyond the influence 
of the three gunas. End of translation. Baba, one cannot have darshan of Golog without Krishna's mercy. Krishna bestowed mercy on the Brajabhasis and granted them darshan of Golog. This Golog is the excellent transcendental abode beyond material nature, and its variegatedness is the embodiment of eternal truth and endless spiritual pastimes. The spiritual effulgence of the Brahma Jyoti exists there eternally as the brilliant radiance, Prabha, of his limbs. When the sadhak is free from all mundane connections with matter, he can have darshan of that special tattva. Vijay, can all liberated personalities have darshan of Golok? Goswami, even among millions of liberated souls, a bhakta of Bhagavan is very rare. In Brahmadam, the jivas who become liberated by the practice of Astanga Yoga and Brahmagyan enjoy forgetfulness of the self. Just as a man in a state of deep sleep, Susupti remains completely inactive, being bereft of power to perceive, to understand, to desire and so forth. Similarly, the jivas who attain Brahmadam are oblivious to their own Atma, so they remain like inanimate lumps. What to speak of them? Even bhaktas absorbed in Aishwarya cannot perceive Goloka. Bhaktas with a mood of Aishwarya render service to an opulent form of the Lord in Vaikuntha, according to their respective bhavs. Even one who engages in Krishna Bhajan in Brajaras can only have darshan of Golok if he is so fortunate that Krishna bestows mercy upon him and releases him from Maya's endless bondage. Vijay, well, if only this type of liberated bhakta can see Golok, why has Golok been described in shastras such as Sri Brahma Samhita, Harivamsa, and the Padma Purana? If Krishna's mercy is only available through Brajabhajan, what was the point of mentioning Golok? Goswami, those Braja Rasik Bhaktas whom Krishna elevates to Golok from this world of five gross elements, Prapancha, can see Golok completely. Furthermore, Shuddha Bhaktas in Braj Bhav can also see Golok to a certain extent. There are two types of Bhaktas, Sadak and Siddha. Sadaks are not qualified to see Golok. Again, there are two types of Siddha Bhaktas, namely Vastu Siddha Bhaktas and Swarup Siddha Bhaktas. Vastu Siddha Bhaktas are brought directly to Golok by Krishna's mercy, whereas Swarup Siddha Bhaktas see the Swarup of Golok, but they are still situated in the Prapancha, material existence, and not directly in Golok. By Krishna's mercy, their eyes of bhakti are in the process of gradually opening. Thus, there are many grades of eligibility in this group. Some see a little, some see something more, and others see more still. To the extent that Krishna is merciful to them, they will see Goloka. As long as they are in the sadhana stage of bhakti, whatever darshan they attain in Golok is tinged with some maik bhav. After crossing the stage of sadhan and reaching the level of bhav, their darshan is somewhat pure, and when they arrive at the stage of prem, they begin to have darshan to the full extent. Vijay Prabhu, in what respects are Golok and Braj different from each other? Goswami, everything that one sees in Braj is present in Goloka, but the various aspects appear somewhat different because of differences in the nishta of the observer. In fact, there is no difference between Golok and Vrindavan. They appear differently to different observers, depending on their different vision. Extremely ignorant people see everything in Braj as material. The vision of a purpose in Rajagun is somewhat more auspicious compared to this, and those who are situated in Sattvagun have darshan of Shuddha Sattva according to their ability to see. Everyone's vision is different according to their adhikar. 
Vijay, Prabhu, I have some realization, but will you kindly give an example to clarify the subject further? A material object cannot serve as a complete example to illustrate spiritual subjects, but still, even a partial indication can give rise to a full realization. Goswami, this is a very difficult problem. We are forbidden to reveal our own confidential realization to others. When you also have some confidential realization, by Krishna's mercy, you should always keep it hidden. I will explain this subject to you only as far as our previous acharyas have revealed it. And by Krishna's mercy, you will be able to see the rest yourself. Perception in Goloka is purely spiritual and there is not the slightest tinge of material perception. To nourish rasa there, the chit shakti has manifested varieties of bhav in many places, and amongst them there is one spiritual conception known as abhiman. For instance, Krishna has no beginning and no birth in Goloka, but to assist the leela, Vatsalya ras is personified there by the conception abhiman in the spiritual existence of fatherhood and motherhood in the form of Nanda and Yashoda. Again, wonderful varieties of Sringararas, such as separation, Vipralamba, and meeting, Sambhog, exist in this conception, Abhiman form. Although the actual situation in Parakya Bhav is Shuddha Swakya, the self-conceptions Abhiman of Paramore beloved Parakya and Paramo lover Upapati are eternally present in it. Just see, all these Abhiman are completely convincing in Braj, for they are exhibited in a gross outward form by the potency of Yogamaya. For example, in Braj, Yashoda labors to give birth to Krishna in her maternity room, and the Nitya Siddha Gopis have a Parakya Abhiman that arises from their marriages to husbands such as Abhimanyu and Govardhan Gopa. In other words, the Abhiman of Golok are all visible in Braj in very tangible forms, which are managed by Yogamaya for the exceedingly subtle original reality. There is not even the slightest trace of falsity in Braj, and it resembles Goloka in all respects. Differences in vision arise only according to the degree of material obstruction of the observer. Vijay, then should one meditate on the appropriate aspects of Astakalya Lila by proper deliberation? Goswami, no, it is not like that. One who has darshan of Brajalila should remember Astakalya Lila according to his realization. By Krishna's mercy, the Lila manifests itself in the sadhak's heart through the power of his bhajan. It is not necessary to try and improve the bhavs of the lila by one's own endeavors. Vijay Yadrishi bhavana yasya siddhir bhavati tadrishi According to this logic, the perfection that one attains corresponds exactly to the type of meditation performed at the time of sadhan so it seems that one must perform purified, immaculate meditation on Goloka. Goswami, what you are saying is correct. All the perceptions in Braj are very pure, and not even a single one is contrary to this. Otherwise there would be a fault. Perfection occurs when sadhana becomes pure, and the purer one's meditation is at the time of sadhana, the faster one attains Siddhi. You should endeavor in such a way that your sadhan may be accomplished beautifully. But still, it is beyond your power to purify your sadhan. Only Krishna, through his achintya shakti, can do this. If you try to do it yourself, you will become entangled in the thorny thickets of Gyan. But if Krishna bestows his mercy, there will be no such injurious result. Vijay Today I have become fortunate. I want to ask one further question. Is the abode of the Dwarka consorts only in Vaikuntha or in Goloka as well? Goswami 
The endless ananda of the chit jagat is attained in Vaikuntha. There is no attainment higher than Vaikuntha. Cities such as Dwarka are there and the young ladies of those cities reside in their own palaces, rendering service to Krishna. The only ones who are situated in the Madhurya Ras of Goloka are the Braja Ramanis. All the pastimes that are in Braj are in Goloka. However, it is mentioned in Gopal Tapani Upanishad that Rogminiji is situated in Swakya Ras in Mathurapur, which is in Goloka. Vijay. Prabhu, do all the activities in Goloka occur in the same sequence as I see them in Braj? Goswami. Yes, they all exist there in the same order, but without the divisions based on Mayak conceptions. However, all such Mayak conceptions have their own supremely pure spiritual origins, which I cannot explain. This you can understand only by the power of your bhajan. Vijay. The whole mundane existence, prapancha, becomes completely dissolved at the time of the universal dissolution, the Mahapralaya. So in what sense is Brajalila eternally present? Goswami. Brajalila is eternal from both the Prakat and Aprakat perspective. The present perception of Brajalila is eternally existing in one of the unlimited universes, which revolve in cyclic order like a wheel. A particular Leela, now present in one Brahmand, appears the next moment in another Brahmand. Thus, that particular Leela is Aprakat Leela in the first Brahmand, but it is present in the next Brahmand in Prakat Leela. In this way, all types of Prakat Leela are eternal. Even in the Aprakat state, all the Leelas are eternally present. Vijay. If Prakat Leela occurs in all the Brahmans, does Brajadam exist in each Brahmand? Goswami. Yes, it does. Goloka is the self manifesting phenomena which is present in every universe as the abode of Krishna Leela. Goloka also manifests itself in the heart of all Shuddha Bhaktas. Vijay. Why does Matura Mandal remain manifest? in a universe where the Leela is non-manifest, Aprakat. Goswami, the Aprakat Leela is eternally present in the Dham, which remains to bestow mercy upon the Bhaktas who reside there. That day's discussion drew to a close. While returning to his residence, Vijay Kumar repeatedly meditate on his seva in Astakalya Leela. Thus ends the 31st chapter of Jaiva Dharma entitled Madhurya Ras, Krishna Swarup, the Nayaks and Swakya Nayikas.